Boa noite, meu irmão, boa noite, minha irmã. Sejam muito bem-vindos a mais uma live da série A Bíblia Me Tornou Católico. E nessa noite de terça-feira, dia 19 de setembro, nós recebemos a presença querida de ninguém menos do que Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn, ele foi pastor presbiteriano durante 10 anos, mas estudando as escrituras sagradas, estudando a teologia da aliança, percebendo a fragilidade do princípio protestante do sola escritura, somente a Bíblia, ele decidiu se tornar católico, isso foi em 
em meados da década de 80, já vai para mais de 30 anos que o Scott Hans se tornou católico, e desde então ele tem sido um instrumento poderoso de Deus, para, com muita caridade, mas ao mesmo tempo com muita verdade, mostrar o caminho de retorno para a Santa Igreja. Esse é um programa que acontece todas as terças-feiras, às 9 horas, aqui no canal Catolicismo Blindado. Eu sou o professor Eduardo Faria. E se você já assistiu outras entrevistas que eu fiz aqui no canal, certamente você percebeu as pessoas dizendo que a leitura do livro Todos os Caminhos Levam a Roma, do Scott Hahn, foi muito importante na conversão. E hoje nós temos a alegria de receber o Scott Hahn aqui conosco. Ele é um teólogo católico de primeira linha, de primeiríssima linha, doutor em teologia. Ele é um autor que tem publicado já dezenas de livros, centenas, talvez milhares de artigos, mas... Ele me disse que ele não gosta de ser identificado só como teólogo, como autor, como famoso, mas ele gosta de ser identificado como marido da Kimberly, pai, avô. Inclusive, ele é pai do padre Jeremy. O seu filho Jeremy recentemente foi ordenado como sacerdote da Santa Igreja Católica. Eu sei que você está ansioso, eu também estou. <risos> eu também estou, então estamos juntos, tá? Estamos juntos, mas, como sempre, eu não posso fazer diferente. Como sempre, eu preciso saudar as pessoas que estão nos assistindo. Eu quero saber de onde você está assistindo. Coloca aí a sua cidade o seu estado aí no chat, que eu quero te conhecer melhor. Antes de eu anunciar de onde vocês estão nos assistindo, alguns lembretes que vocês já sabem, mas é importante relembrar. Primeiro, curta esse vídeo, já deixa aí o seu like, isso é muito importante para que o YouTube entregue para mais pessoas. Segundo, se inscreva no canal. Muitas pessoas que estão assistindo ainda não são inscritas, e é com a sua, o seu ato de inscrição que, que esse canal cresce e atinge mais pessoas, evangeliza mais pessoas. Então, já se inscreva de uma vez. Se você puder e quiser, você pode comprar um super chat, um super sticker. Isso ajuda demais o canal. Ou você pode fazer uma doação via Pix. O Pix está projetado aí na tela. E essas doações, além de ajudarem nos custos do canal, também nos encorajam a continuar fazendo o que a gente está fazendo. O Pix está projetado aí e você pode também doar fazendo um, um super chat, um, um super sticker, por exemplo. O Francioli já começou a live fazendo um super sticker. Boa noite, Salve Maria, Viva Cristo Rei, São Pedro do Suaçuí, Minas Gerais. O Nielsen também, o Nielsen Amaral. E a Ana Cláudia também. Boa noite. Muito legal as entrevistas, já vi todas. Muito obrigado, gente, pela generosidade, pelo carinho. O que mais? Ah, compartilhar. Você também deve compartilhar essa live. Eu quero anunciar de onde vocês estão assistindo. Vamos lá. Cíntia Maria, de Ponta Grossa, Regina Rocha, de Juiz de Fora, bairro São Mateus. Olha só, Regina, eu também estou em Juiz de Fora, pertinho do bairro São Mateus. Gabriel Lima, de Nova Russas, Ceará. Quem mais? Paula, de São... O que é SBO? São Bernardo? Deve ser, né? O Rafael Medina, grande Rafael Medina, de Boston. Helena de Juiz de Fora, Helena Toledo de Juiz de Fora, olha só o pessoal de, aqui de Juiz de Fora me prestigiando, Lucimar Lima de Salvador, Bahia, Bruno de São José do Norte, Rio Grande do Sul, 
Francimar de Recife, Pernambuco, Rafaela de Vila Velha, Joana Nóbrega, Junco do Seridó, Paraíba, e ela ainda coloca, aluna do catolicismo blindado, muito bem, Joana, Lourenço de Uberlândia, Marcos de Itapuá, Santa Catarina, Ivoneide de Garanhuns, William da Califórnia, Bianca de Cuiabá, Daniele de São José do Rio Preto, Amabel de Mirassol. Deixa eu ver os primeiros aqui, aquela turma que falou de onde estava, onde até mesmo antes de eu perguntar. Quer ver? Tem uma turma aqui que já entra sabendo que é para falar isso. Olha só, deixa eu ver aqui, ó. Rosilane, esperando ansiosamente, direto de Costa da Caparica, Portugal. Olha aí, tá vendo? Sabia que tinha gente que já anunciava onde estava, antes mesmo de eu perguntar. Lu Sivana, Campo Maior, Piauí. Alba, Natal, Rio Grande do Norte. Rafael Ferreira, São José dos Campos, São Paulo. Quem mais? Antônio Francisco, Águas Lindas, Goiás. Odete de Curitiba. Muito bem, gente. Olha, eu gostaria de ficar aqui. Ó, a Mairla, não, Mairla, eu acho que é Mairla, ela é minha aluna, Mairla, de Massachusetts. Falei certo? Massachusetts. Muito bem, gente. Bom, queria ficar a noite toda falando aqui de onde, de onde vocês são. Olha só, Andressa, thank you, Mr. Han, for this opportunity. Muito bem, Andressa. Mas eu não posso, gente, ficar a noite inteira lendo. Um dia eu vou fazer uma live só para ler <risos> de onde vocês estão. Mas o fato é que a gente tem gente do norte, do sul, do leste, do oeste, do nordeste, do norte, do, nor do sudeste, do sul, do centro-oeste e gente dos Estados Unidos, gente de Portugal. Isso me honra demais. Isso me honra demais. Quero agradecer o Renato Queiroga e também... A Lisandra, olha só, muito ansiosa por essa entrevista. Eu gosto muito do seu trabalho, que Deus te abençoe sempre, que Nossa Senhora te cubra com seu manto sagrado, professor Eduardo. Te acompanho da Austrália. Que legal! Ela fez um, um super sticker aqui em dólar australiano, gente. Olha como que eu tô chique. Lisandra, obrigado, minha irmã, pelo, pelo carinho. Quem mais? O Paulo... Boa noite, os livros do Scott Hunt foram fundamentais para minha esposa e eu deixarmos o protestantismo e abraçarmos a Santa Igreja. Glória a Deus, Paulo Rodrigues. Quem sabe um dia você e a sua esposa contam para a gente como que foi esse roteiro de volta para casa. Muito bem, a gente já vai começar. Antes de começar, eu tenho só mais um aviso, um aviso muito importante, um aviso que você não quer perder. E eu vou, eu vou tentar ser rápido, tá? Vou marcar aqui no relógio, porque vocês não querem ficar me ouvindo. Vocês querem ouvir o Scott Hunt. Então, eu vou ser rápido. <risos> ah, se eu falei isso, já demorou mais, né? Vamos lá. Um, dois, três. Valendo. Neste sábado, dia 23 de setembro, eu vou fazer a imersão Como Ler a Bíblia Segundo a Fé Católica. Você vai aprender os princípios interpretativos da Santa Igreja Católica. Você vai aprender a ler a Bíblia a partir do coração da Santa Igreja Católica. Eu quero te convidar para participar dessa imersão comigo, vai ser ao vivo, pelo Zoom, a gente vai passar seis horas juntos, de dez da manhã a quatro da tarde, a gente vai fazer uma pausa para o almoço, mas a gente vai ficar o sábado junto, e estudando a Bíblia e estudando sobre como estudar a Bíblia. Você vai aprender a perder o medo, a perder o o sem jeito, sabe aquela história, o sem jeito mandou lembrança? Você vai aprender o, a perder o sem jeito ao se aproximar das escrituras, a se aproximar da Bíblia, que é um livro católico. Doa a quem doer. Tem gente que não gosta disso, que vai espernear, que vai fazer pirraça, mas isso não muda o fato de que a Bíblia é um livro católico. A Bíblia foi, escrito por, foi escrita por católicos, foi compilada por católicos, foi preservada por católicos, 
e a Bíblia é um livro católico, e ela foi escrita para ser lida dentro do coração da Santa Igreja, e a gente vai aprender como fazer isso. São Jerônimo dizia que ignorância das Escrituras é a ignorância de Cristo. E eu quero que nós sejamos íntimos das Escrituras para que sejamos íntimos de Cristo. Gente, para participar dessa imersão, é um valor simbólico, R$ 27,00. Tá? Muita gente perguntando, ah, e se eu quiser ver depois? Se quiser ver depois, você pode adquirir a gravação da imersão. A imersão é uma coisa, ao vivo, a gente vai estar junto... E a gravação é outra coisa, aí você coloca mais nove reais, nove, nove alguma coisa, acho que é nove noventa, e você vai ter a gravação também, para você ter acesso a ela. Porém, vai ser pelo Zoom. E o Zoom, não sei se você conhece esse aplicativo, ele, a sala é limitada o tamanho, a, a quantidade de pessoas que podem estar na sala. De modo que você precisa se inscrever, porque as vagas estão se esgotando mesmo. Não é papo furado. As vagas estão se esgotando mesmo. Então, clica no primeiro link aqui da descrição, faça a sua inscrição o quanto antes, porque as vagas vão se esgotar antes de sábado. Eu estou achando que amanhã ou quinta já esgota. Aí você pensa assim, ah, então vou fazer amanhã. Se eu fosse você, eu faria agora. Bom, vocês são meus convidados para essa imersão. Sem mais demoras... Ah, não, peraí, que teve mais gente que mandou super sticker. O Hernani, muito obrigado, Hernani. O, a Gabriele, obrigado, Gabriele. E o Nielsen. Estou fazendo o curso Catolicismo Blindado e está me ajudando muito nas aulas de catecismo que dou na paróquia. Tem todos os livros do Scott Hahn lançados no Brasil. Olha só, gente, um catequista, aluno do Catolicismo Blindado e leitor do Scott Hahn, é, que, que bênção de Deus na vida dos catequizanos. Né? Bom, parabéns, Nelson, e obrigado pela, pela doação. Muito bem, agora se mais alguém doar, eu falo no final, porque eu sei que vocês querem ver a entrevista. A entrevista, gente, ela foi gravada. Tem gente, ah, eu queria que fosse ao vivo, gente. Para ser ao vivo, eu precisaria de ficar traduzindo e agarrar demais a entrevista, então ela foi gravada. Inclusive, algumas pessoas já até assistiram essa entrevista há um tempo atrás, mas ela foi gravada e foi legendada. Então, eu vou soltar aqui para você a entrevista gravada, legendada, porque se ela fosse ao vivo, totalmente ao vivo, eu ia ter que ficar traduzindo, ia atrapalhar demais o transcorrer, porque o Scott Hill é uma enciclopédia bíblica ambulante, uma enciclopédia ambulante, não dava para ficar traduzindo todo, todo, mas a gente legendou. Tá? legendou, com letras garrafais, para você poder ler tranquilamente. E o pessoal falou assim, ah, por que, que você não faz dublado? Eu, se tiver alguém com a voz bonita, voz de locutor, quiser dublar, entre em contato comigo, tá bom? Meu e-mail é contato <risos> Ó, o Fabiano, o Fábio está falando aqui, curtam a live, curtam a live, gente. Vamos lá. 18 minutos aqui já de, de papo, né? O pessoal falar. 18 minutos, demorou muito. Vamos lá então? Dr. Scott Hunt, good evening. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. You're most welcome, Eduardo. It's great to be with you and to make this connection. All right, thank you. Uh, as I told you before, when we were talking, your books here in Brazil are incredibly uh, popular and they are helping a lot of people. Uh, they are helping two kinds of people in Brazil. They are helping Catholics to strengthen their faith and they are also helping uh, Protestants and even lots of former Protestants that have found their way back to to the church so i would like you to to greet our our audience first well thank you eduardo i would like very much to do that it's been several years since i was down in brazil and i had the most wonderful time hosted by my dear friend professor felipe aquino and hosted by his whole family as well it was an unforgettable time and so i'm grateful for cleophas publishing all of these books of mine in translation 
And I do hope and pray that our Lord will hasten the day when I'll be able to return to your beautiful country. Amen. We'd love that. Uh, I believe that most of the people who are watching this interview already know you, but maybe we have some people who were like, I don't know, browsing through YouTube and, and came across this interview. So could you please uh, tell us a little bit about your, your background, about your, your life story, uh, You can you can do that very shortly, please. Okay, sure. Well, I'm 65. I have six kids. I've been married to my wife, Kimberly, for 42 years. We now have 21 grandchildren uh, from the age of 13 down. Um, those are from the first three of our kids. The next one, Jeremiah, is now a Catholic priest, Father Jeremiah, for our own wow. Diocese of Steubenville. And we also... Uh, Have uh, Well, we've lived here in Steubenville since 1990. I came into the Catholic Church in 1986. Kimberly came in in 1990 as we were preparing to move out here to Ohio. I was raised in a Protestant family. It was rather nominal. I had a dramatic conversion around the age of 14 out of a life of crime and juvenile delinquency. I found Christ. He found me. And he opened up the scriptures and set my heart on fire. The formation that I got in high school and college and seminary was evangelical. It was Protestant. It was Calvinistic. And so mm -hmm. I was very, very Calvinistic and, as a consequence, very anti-Catholic, perhaps more than anybody else I knew. <laughs> It was mostly misunderstanding, not prejudice or, or bigotry. But suffice to say that... Uh, As I experienced the grace of conversion in high school, I began reading through scripture, and then I went back over it again. And so when I went off to college, I had the privilege of studying accelerated Greek for the New Testament. And as a climax, I had a semester devoted to translating the final book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of St. John, which back in the 70s was the, uh, the most discussed and debated book uh, in the New Testament, and probably still is. Mm -hmm. In any case, I got married in 1979, and my wife and I moved to Boston, Massachusetts, where we studied in seminary to get my master's degree. I was ordained a pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Virginia, but then began diving more deeply into the church fathers who made scripture come alive And so I was in a crisis of faith. I had to resign from the church, and I had to go in search of a church that fit what I was finding in the Bible mm -hmm. as the early church fathers read it, and how it was that the New Testament's concealed in the Old, and the Old is revealed and fulfilled in the New, as St. Augustine put it so aptly. Well, suffice to say that uh, this ended up leading me into a doctoral program in theology at Marquette University in Milwaukee, where out of curiosity, I, I attended a Catholic mass for the first time hmm. on a weekday at noon in a basement chapel where the scales fell from my eyes with the words of consecration. And then when everybody began to chant Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, it was as though uh, a eureka grace of discovery As they were going forward for Holy Communion, I was going backwards in my New Testament to the book of Revelation. Hmm. I knew Jesus is called many things, Alpha and Omega, uh, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Lion of the tribe of Judah. But the one thing that he's called there more than all of the other titles is Lamb of God, Lamb of God, 28 times in 22 chapters, and I never knew why. And so when I was looking down at the pages of the Apocalypse, I'm seeing Lamb of God, Lamb of God, holy, 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 the amen, the alleluia. And suddenly I realized that I had not only gone downstairs to a basement chapel for a daily mass, I had been whisked up to the heavenly Jerusalem for wow. the liturgy of the angels and the saints. And so for the next two weeks, I secretly attended mass, finding myself falling in love with our Lord Jesus in a whole new way and scripture coming alive in a much more dynamic and dramatic fashion.
And so I was still thinking at that point, I would wait four or five years before I became a Catholic. It ended up hastening my journey along. So it ended up being about four or five months when I was received into the church at the Easter Vigil in 1986. I look back and it's the greatest grace that God gave me besides showing me his son, my savior, Jesus. Amen. Thank you to, to th thank you for that. And would you say that that experience you had, I don't know, almost 40 years ago was uh, one of the things that led you to writing the book, uh, The Supper of the Lamb? Indeed, it was, right? So, you know, when Kimberly came into the church in 1990, we were reunited after four painful years. Mm. And we had the opportunity to share our journey of faith by telling our story to various groups and audiences. And so somebody transcribed one of our talks and it became a book, Rome Sweet Home, which is also mm -hmm. translated into Portuguese down there yeah. in Brazil. And then a little later, a little while later, I uh, I wrote a book called A Father Who Keeps His Promises, God's Covenant Love in Scripture, looking at the old and the new with the centrality of the notion of covenant as family. And then in 1999, at long last, I could write the whole part of that story, which is the Lamb's Supper, discovering how the Mass is heaven on earth and how it is that the apocalypse basically reflects the two-part structure of the Mass, the mm -hmm. liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the, the Eucharist, and likewise how the Book of Revelation comes alive and is fulfilled not just at the end of time, but at the beginning of each week when we go to Mass. We don't have to die in order to go to heaven. There really is a sense in which the angels and the saints surround us, and heaven comes to earth, and we are lifting up our hearts to heaven, but we are also lifted up and raised in the Holy Spirit to participate in the worship of the angels and the saints. Their songs, their prayers are the same as ours, and we are all worshiping the Lamb standing as though he had been slain. And it just, mm. to me, even now, it feels as though, you know, it happened not 36 years ago, but more like uh, 36 hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I teach my students that the Catholic Church wrote, uh, compiled, or canonized, and preserved the scriptures. The Catholic Church wrote, canonized, and preserved the scriptures. And nowadays, it's not uncommon to see people saying that Catholic doctrine contradicts the Bible. So my, my question to you is, uh, does the Bible contradict Catholic doctrine? Well, of course not. Uh, mm -hmm. The Bible is what led me to become a Catholic after being an anti-Catholic, after being an evangelical, Bible-believing, New Testament Christian for well over 10 years, 12 years of my life. Uh, I was probably the least likely to convert in college and seminary. But like Saul, the Pharisee, was the least likely to convert. I didn't have uh, experience on the road to Damascus where I was literally blinded. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I did have an experience of uh, discovering the depth of sacred scripture. You know, as a New Testament Christian, I used to look for texts that would prove the doctrines that I believed. One of my professors in seminary just stated the obvious when he said to take a text out of context to use it as a proof text, is a pretext. <laughs> and we all laughed in that graduate seminar, but a, a few of us also squirmed because we sort of felt as though, well, isn't that what we've been doing for years? And so to read the New Testament in its larger context requires us to really immerse ourselves in the Old Testament, because practically speaking, the New Testament is unintelligible apart from the Old. But on its own, if we simply read the Old Testament, it's like a story in search of an ending because the people of God are dispersed among the nations, scattered in exile, waiting for all of these promises to be fulfilled. And so with the incarnation of the word, mm 
Jesus, the Christ, we have a fulfillment that really surpasses the highest hopes of the Hebrew people. It goes beyond the wildest dreams of the most devout Jews, and yet at the same time, it's something that would challenge even people who had mastered the Hebrew Bible, the law and the prophets, like Saul, mm -hmm. the Pharisee, who had studied under the greatest rabbi of that age, Gamaliel. And so it really took a blinding light. And then suddenly it also took uh, three days of natural blindness in order for supernatural vision to be given. And then suddenly you can see how the new is concealed in the old and how the old is fulfilled in the new. And for me, that was the key to becoming a, a, a consistent and faithful New Testament Christian. One other thing I would say is this. I ran into an old friend from high school a few years ago, and he was a Catholic back then, and I was an evangelical Presbyterian, and I would target him and his friends. They were my friends, but I wanted to share the gospel with them, and I saw their Catholic faith getting in the way. Well, in any case, when I ran into him at the airport, he reminded me of that, and he was so excited because he said, I am now what you are. I'm an evangelical, Bible-believing, New Testament Christian, not that silly Catholic kid you knew back then. <laughs> and so uh, I had some news to share with with Chris, and I said, well, I'm an evangelical, Bible-believing, New Testament Catholic Christian. And when he got over his shock, he wanted to be sure to connect. And so we talked on the phone within about a week or so. And one of the things I shared with Chris was in desiring to be a New Testament Christian, I delved more deeply into the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But along the way, I discovered something rather disturbing, that when you read the New Testament, in the original Greek or in a good translation, you discover that the only time Jesus ever uses that phrase, the New Testament or the New Covenant in the mm -hmm. Greek, it's kaine diatheke. Mm -hmm. Kaine diatheke. Yeah. In Luke 22, 20, when he is consecrating the chalice, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new, new. the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he doesn't say, write this in remembrance of me. He says, do this. And of course, what is this? Well, this is the Eucharist that he just instituted, but he didn't call it the Eucharist. He called it the New Testament. The only time he used the phrase was with reference to the Eucharist. He didn't say, write this. He said, do this. And so the more I studied the fathers, the more I could see clearly why it was that in the first 200 years of the New Testament church, the New Testament was a sacrament, the mm -hmm. blood sacrament, long before it became a document according to the document. And it doesn't devalue the New Testament as a document. It just shows us that the New Testament was, in fact, a sign that pointed us back to Christ himself, who is the New Testament in his body and his blood, and he's offering himself in that way. He never wrote anything down. Mm -hmm. Neither did he command the disciples to write anything down. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad that some of them did, but most of the 12 never did. Mm -hmm. you know, less than half of them ended up contributing a single book to the collection that we now call the New Testament, but not because they were lazy or disobedient. And even, even those who did, read, who, who did write, for example, the Apostle John, he says, uh, I have much more to say to you, but I'd rather do that in person. <laughs> That's right. And so St. Matthew and St. John wrote us Gospels. Luke was Paul's companion. And of course, John Mark was Peter's companion. Mm -hmm. But these books weren't written for several years. And so the church wasn't sitting around waiting and wondering, what are we supposed to believe in? Because Christ didn't write anything down. He didn't command them to write anything down. He commanded them to preach the gospel, to baptize those in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to do this in remembrance. And we can see that in Acts 2, 42 to 46, where at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls. And so Peter preaches the gospel like our Lord had done. Mm -hmm. He baptizes through 3,000 new believers, and then he celebrates the breaking of the bread. And so the takeaway for me was that to be 
a consistent New Testament Christian. To be a radical New Testament Christian required me to become a Eucharistic Catholic if, in mm -hmm. fact, the New Testament is what Jesus calls the Eucharist, and in fact, the early church as well. It wasn't until around the year 191 that you have a document. We don't know exactly who wrote it, but in that document, we have a reference to the books of the New Testament being drawn out to be read to prepare for the celebration of the Eucharist. But since the Eucharist was still the New Testament in the year 190, 191, these books that had been written by the leaders of the Catholic Church, and as you said, Eduardo, compiled by the leaders of the Catholic Church, the successors of the apostles, mm -hmm. the bishops, who eventually canonized it, but not until really 380, the late 4th century. But here in 191, the earliest references to the books of the New Testament, but even then, the books weren't called the New Testament. The books were a liturgical document mm. that was compiled to be read in preparation and proclamation to enter into the mystery of the Eucharist. But the Eucharist it was still the New Testament, which is what made these the books of the New Testament. Hmm. And so to recognize that reading the New Testament was a preparation for celebrating the New Testament, but that the Eucharist is what Christ called the New Testament— and likewise, not only in Luke 22, 20, but Luke's mentor, St. Paul, as you know, Eduardo, is the first New Testament writer mm -hmm. of the New Testament. And the first time he speaks of the New Testament is in 1 Corinthians 11, verses uh, 35 through 36. And there you have St. Paul speaking about not what it's like to write 1 Corinthians, one of the books of the New Testament, but how on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and then after the supper, and he speaks the same way Luke does of the New Testament in terms of the institution of the Holy Eucharist. And again, I want to mm. emphasize, this doesn't devalue the document. If anything, it invests the document with a much deeper, mm -hmm. sacramental, liturgical, Christological depth. And, you know, it struck me that if you're reading the New Testament document, apart from the sacrament that the document is pointing us to, you're taking the text out of its Eucharistic context. Hmm. That is not spiritually proper. That is not scientifically proper. Hmm. You wouldn't think much of a scientist who called himself a botanist if he's ripping plants out of the forest, <laughs> bringing them into the laboratory, and then wondering why they're wilting and withering under the hot, bright lights. I mean, that's what happens when you take an organism out of its natural setting, its natural habitat. And the New Testament has for its own supernatural setting, its own natural habitat, the Eucharistic worship of the early church. And so when you do that, when you take it out of the ecclesiastical, liturgical, sacramental, Eucharistic setting, 500 years later, you end up with over 40,000 mm -hmm. denominations founded by New Testament Christians who would pass a lie detector test, you know, saying, mm -hmm. I'm interpreting the New Testament better than the other people who came before me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact that they're sincere doesn't in any way imply that they can't also be sincerely wrong. <laughs> like I, <didn't laughs> yeah. I was. And so this was a jarring moment for me. And I shared that with Chris. And Chris not only found his way back into the Catholic Church, but he's on fire now as an evangelical, Bible-believing, New Testament Catholic Christian. In fact, he, uh, he serves on the board of trustees for the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> so amazing. Well, uh, so based on what you just said, like uh, the New Testament... Is not a list of books. The New Testament is the, the Holy Eucharist. Uh, when the Reformers, they, they told the people and, 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 and they established their, their religion with their service or, or as, as the worship service uh, focused and centered completely 
on the preaching of the word, they, they made a, a huge mistake then, right? Because they did. I mean, it, it's, it's not that the preaching of the word is not important. Of, of course it is. But they elevated the preaching of the word above sacraments and above the Holy Eucharist. And nowadays we have as many views on the Eucharist as we have churches, right? That's right. That's right. You know, so when we look at the Old Testament and we can see how it is that God ratifies and renews his covenant with the people of God, with ancient Israel, throughout salvation history, such as we find in Exodus 24, you have the reading of the book of the law, but you have the, or what is technically called the book of the covenant in Exodus mm -hmm. 24. Then you have the blood of the covenant there in verse 8, and that sacrificial blood is thrown upon the altar representing God and the heads of the people to show a blood bond that is renewed between God as a father and his family, the people of Israel. The 12 tribes that form a nation, but a national family. Mm -hmm. and likewise, in Jerusalem, with the next covenant that is established with David and Solomon, the son of David, you also have the proclamation of the word the reading of the law, but you have the sacrifice, and it's the sacrifice that brings the glory of God down from heaven in the form of fire that consumes the sacrifices. And so it's always word and sacrament. It is always the proclamation of the word of God, but then it is the renewal of the covenant in the form of a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And this is the key. I mean, in Nehemiah 8, as well as in Ezra, you have the renewal of the covenant there at the temple, but it's never just reducible to the proclamation of the word, nor is the sacrament just simply a kind of flat ritual. It's always a sacrifice. I remember reading uh, Rabbi Baruch Levine, and he was the one who pointed out to me that um, in the Old Testament, you never find the word synagogue or rabbi, because in the Old Testament, you have a religion that is defined by the tabernacle or the temple as a sanctuary, mm -hmm. the priest who approaches an altar to offer a sacrifice, that's the climax of worship. It's only after the temple is destroyed in 70 AD that you move to exclusive arrangements such as the synagogue with a rabbi who takes the scroll and reads it and proclaims a sermon, but you don't have a priest, you don't have a temple, you don't have an altar, you don't have a sacrifice. And he said, on the one hand, Protestant worship is based upon synagogal religion. Even though synagogue is not found in the Old Testament, nor the term rabbi, you know, and mm. again, you have the proclamation of the word, but always as a means to the end. And Levine then concludes that if you want to find anything that really reflects the pattern of the Old Testament, you'd have to go to a Catholic parish where mm. they have a priest and an altar the word is proclaimed, the scriptures are read, but the culmination of the worship service is the sacrifice. And it's not just a meal, it really is a sacrifice that Christ, our high priest in heaven, is offering on our behalf to the Father. But at the same time, he represents his Father in turning around like Melchizedek and offering to us the heavenly bread and wine of his own heavenly self-offering so that the power of the Holy Spirit is what transforms the bread and the wine into the resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. I mean, this is like the gospel that you and I used to preach, Eduardo, as mm -hmm. evangelicals, but it's like the Catholic gospel is the good news on steroids. It's almost too good <laughs> to be true, but exactly. it's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Mm. And based on what you just said, like uh, the, the, the Protestant churches of today are like synagogues, uh, it, it came to my mind a thought, and, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but when, when evangelicals, when they have, for example, a praise and worship conference, oh, we're going to host a praise and worship conference. What is a praise and worship conference? is a conference about music, about singing, about writing songs. Uh, and in my opinion, it's like they 
they, they, they think that praise and worship are synonyms because since they do not have the Eucharistic sacrifice, they think that adoring, worshiping is the same as praising. And maybe that is why they call us idolaters because when they see us praising Mary, praising the saints, they think that we are worshiping Mary and worshiping the saints. But the, the, the truth of the matter is that they think that praise and worship are synonyms because they just got rid of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense, Eduardo. In fact, I'd like to reinforce the point you've just made because it was another eureka moment for me on the path to becoming a Catholic. Mm. So, so Catholics pray to Mary and the saints. They sing songs to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to the saints. They, they also thank them for their faithfulness. And so if the only form of worship that you have is praise and prayer and music, and you see Catholics doing that, well, of course, that is Mariolatry, that is idolatry. You know, I, I think that there are several different problems with that Protestant viewpoint, because, you know, praying to dead people is wrong, but they're not dead. They're more mm -hmm. alive than we are. And that's why in the visions of John, in the book of Revelation, you have the angels along with the saints and the martyrs, as well as the woman who is the mother of the Christ, the mother of the Messiah, and they're alive. They don't get distracted, bored, or tired. They don't go to sleep. Their love is perfected, not only their love for God, but their love for us. So they're not disallowed from praying for us. In, he, in Revelation 6, you can see that the martyrs are praying for us. God is hearing their prayers, and he's sending us grace and help in response to those prayers. Likewise, if there, we believe in communion, the communion of saints, it can't be just a one-way conversation where they know what we're doing and they can pray for us, but we can't ask them to pray. No, the prayers of a righteous man avail of much. That's not just true for Elijah when he was on earth. That was true for Elijah when he was taken up to heaven on chariots of fire, as we read in Second Kings. And so, you know, the bottom line is this, that in antiquity, there was no such thing as religion apart from sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice was always the main event in Judaism, but also in the northern kingdom. But if you look at Phoenicia, Egypt, the granite, it's idolatrous there. But there was no worship without sacrifice. And, you know, this is something that Augustine states matter of factly, that the highest virtue is justice. The highest form of justice is religion. And the supreme act of religion is sacrifice. Now, if you assume that the sacrifice of Christ happened at Calvary and it's over and done, a thing of the past, then you would say, well, there is no more sacrifice. Therefore, the only possible expression of praise and worship is prayer, song, mm -hmm. that sort Singing. of thing. Two responses. On the one hand, you know, in human culture, we often petition people. Like, uh, you know, in American courts, we have the legal practice of the attorney approaching the judge and saying, I pray thee, your honor, or we petition the court. Well, we're not divinizing the judge. We're mm -hmm. just recognizing that there's sacred activity going on in this sacred space dealing with justice. Likewise, we might sing to the president, hail to the chief. There are certain songs that we sing. Happy birthday to family members. Happy anniversary to our parents. We're not idolaters. No, that's the way families operate. We ask favors of one another. We ask them to pray for us. We're not compromising the sufficiency of Christ, our high priest, when we ask other people to pray, because the other people are participating in his priesthood. They're participating in his own priestly intercession, just like we do when we pray for other people. But the second response that I would say is this, that, um, and this is going to take a couple of minutes, you know, the idea that Calvary is the only sacrifice from here on is, I think, true, but it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, this was a conversation that I had with Chris 
while he was still an ex-Catholic, and he approached me about seeing, you know, he reminded me, back in high school, you saw the Eucharist as a meal, and Calvary was the sacrifice. And he said, you know, that's how I see it now. So if you don't mind me kind of turning the tables on you, where in the New Testament do you find the Eucharist as a sacrifice? Because I see it as Calvary. And I shared with Chris what I had found in the Church Fathers, namely this, that if you had been standing there at Calvary on Good Friday, witnessing the crucifixion as a devout disciple, as a faithful Jew, no one standing there would have possibly said, oh, this is a sacrifice. No, this is an execution. Yeah, exactly. What all Christians profess together in the 21st century is what none of his devout followers could have possibly recognized in the first century. For a sacrifice to be offered, it has to be inside the Temple of Jerusalem, on top of an altar with a Levitical priest standing by to offer the sacrifice. Jesus is sacrificed outside the walls, far from the temple, where there were no altars with Levites standing by to offer a sacrifice. As you just said, Eduardo, what the witnesses would have described after the event would have been a Roman execution, perhaps Mm -hmm. martyrdom if they were totally convinced of his innocence, but no sacrifice. So how in the world does a Roman execution get turned into a holy sacrifice and one that is so holy that it retired all of the animals that were offered inside the Jerusalem temple? The only way you can find an answer to that, as I went in search of an answer to that question, how does an execution get turned into a sacrifice? All of the early church fathers pointed back to St. Paul, especially 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, where Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast, and the feast that he goes on to teach them all about is what we call the Eucharist in chapters 10 and 11. Mm. So what Paul was doing was simply reminding the Corinthians of what Jesus was doing on Holy Thursday celebrating the Passover, he wasn't just celebrating it one last time, he was fulfilling it as the Lamb of God, but he was fulfilling the Passover of the Old Covenant by instituting the Eucharist to be the Passover of the New Covenant. And what was the Passover in the Old? It wasn't simply a meal. It was a meal secondarily, but it was a sacrifice primarily. Just ask Mm -hmm. any man if he could talk, he would tell you this is more than a meal. And if that's true in the old, it's not less but more true in the new, where Jesus is not just an irrational animal having his throat slashed, his body roasted, and so we can share in the the meat of the body of the lamb. No, he is laying down his life as the lamb of God, taking away the sin of the world. That's the only thing that could have made sense of the words of institution, the words of consecration. He was instituting the Eucharist, where the sacrifice of the new Passover is initiated, and Mm -hmm. then do they realize the next day that that was his body that was given up, that was his blood that was poured out. He didn't lose his life on Friday if he laid his life down as a holy sacrifice by initiating the sacrifice in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the initiation, Calvary is the consummation. He's not the victim of Roman violence as much as the victim of divine love and mercy. And so I explained to Chris that it is the Eucharist as the Passover of the new covenant that transforms Calvary from an execution to a sacrifice. That if the Eucharist is only a meal, then Calvary is only a execution. But if Holy Thursday is where the sacrifice is initiated, we can Mm. see how Good Friday is where the sacrifice is consummated. And then Easter Sunday is precisely where that sacrifice is transformed into the blessed sacrament through the resurrection and his ascension. The Paschal mystery is complete, which is the memorial of his death and resurrection and ascension. The memorial, Thursday, the death, Friday, his resurrection, Sunday, and then his ascension into heaven is his exaltation not only as king, Mm. but as a royal high priest, because the body that is offered in the Mass is the same body that was in the upper room, the same body that was nailed to the cross, but specifically and precisely 
the form of Jesus' body right now is resurrected, ascended, hmm. divinized, not only in heaven, but on earth as well. And so we're not repeating the sacrifice of Calvary. No, we're participating in his heavenly self-offering. And so when the book of Hebrews says it's once for all, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it was terminated at, fr at Calvary on Friday. No, it means that it's perpetuated. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and every priest is, 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 every priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, Hebrews 8, verse 3. Hence, it is necessary for our high priest to have something to offer. The only thing he offers is his body, and the only form of his body now is glorified. And so you can't repeat something that's never ending. So mm -hmm. the sacrifice of the mass is not some vain repetition of a sacrifice. We're not repeating Calvary. No, the priesthood of Christ is everlasting. And so his own self-offering in heaven is continuous. Is ongoing, yeah. Our brains and our hearts start to explode with insight and with joy. And I remember Chris saying to me at the end of the phone conversation, like, Wow, you know, this makes me want to go back and practically rethink everything. And I'm like, been there, done that. I mean, <laughs> like Saul to Paul, anti Catholic to Catholic at warp speed, as it were. And there's there's one thing that people miss is that the the Jewish Passover, like on the table of the, the Jewish Passover, there would be uh the bread, the wine. And the lamb, That's right. and as the the gospel writers tell the, the tell us the story, we see on the table the bread and the wine. We do not see the lamb on the table. We That's only right. see the lamb at the table, but not on the table. That's right. I mean, right? scholars debate whether there was a lamb or not because if there's not a lamb. It wouldn't be a Passover. On the other hand, the fact that the lamb is not mentioned in any of the yeah, gospels exactly. tells it's us the reason why it's not mentioned. Not uh -huh. because it wasn't there necessarily, mm -hmm. but because whatever was there in the form of the old covenant Passover lamb is in a certain sense transcended. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't like the new replaces the old. There's a sense in which the new both includes the old and concludes it as well by taking it up to a higher level than the shadows. You find that the shadows that are cast are cast by Christ and the sacrifice of the animals are only shadows mm -hmm. of reality of Christ's self-offering that again is instituted and initiated on Holy Thursday in the upper room. It is consummated on Good Friday. And then in the resurrection and the ascension, he is exalted to take his glorified humanity to the Father on our behalf and offer it there and then turn around as the epiclesis, as the as our priest pronounced the epiclesis, the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. comes down upon the bread and the wine. And the priest doesn't say, this is your body. He doesn't say, this is his body. Because when my son Jeremiah became a Catholic priest last year, he gave his lips, he gave his lungs, he gave his life and his body and soul to our Lord to mm -hmm. speak and act through him in persona Christi Capita. So that Christ is the only head of the mystical body, but there really is a sense in which it doesn't depend upon how good or bad the priest is, because the high priest, Jesus, is the one who's working and speaking and acting through these Catholic priests. And this is what you find universally affirmed by the early church fathers, as I know, Eduardo, you discovered in your own research as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Asking the question, what is the biblical basis for so-and-so is not the best question. And here is my question to you, Dr. Hun, because uh, the, the, the author of Hebrews, he says, he starts his book by saying, in the past, uh, God spoke to us through the prophets, and now he speaks to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And when we, we uh, listen to his son, his son tells the church, those who hear you, hear me. So uh, he does not say those who, who read the Bible, hear me. 
as important that it is to, to read the Bible. But he says, those who hear you, they hear me. Like he's, he's uh, bestowing upon his church that power. So if God speaks to us through Christ, and if Christ himself said that those who hear the church hears him, uh, what do you think of this question, Dr. Han? What is the biblical basis for so-and-so? How should we elaborate that question correctly? And why so many people that claim to believe the Bible, they also see uh, that the Bible and the Bible contradicts Catholic Church. Why is that? I mean, is it because they are away from the tradition of the church? Is it because they are away from the family? Or even though they are our, our brothers, they are our separate brothers. So why? Uh, what do you think of this question? What is the best way to, to enunciate it? And why do you think that so many people that love the Bible come to conclusions so different? Well, you know, when you think about America, for example, you recognize the influence of our founding fathers. You know, in South America, it might be Simon Bolivar or someone else. You know, mm -hmm. the fact is the founding fathers of Protestantism, Martin Luther, John Calvin and others, basically transmit a tradition that reflects their own outlook, their own theological conviction. And so I would propose that this is why once you affirm sola scriptura, like Luther and Calvin, you set into motion a legacy that is going to end up bringing about hmm, anarchy within the church. 20, 30, 40, almost 50,000 denominations that all differ on how to interpret the new, how they understand baptism, how they understand the Eucharist, how they understand all kinds of other doctrines regarding the Trinity and Christ and so on. The fathers of the church were more directly linked to Christ and the apostles precisely because invariably the vast majority of the fathers of the church were bishops. And mm -hmm. as such, they were successors of the apostles. And so just as the apostles are the 12 cornerstones, the 12 foundation stones of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, there's a sense in which this living temple with living stones is built upon that by the fathers of the church, the second, third, fourth, and fifth centuries. And what you don't find in any of them is sola scriptura. You find a passionate love for sacred scripture, but always as a means to an end. And so, you know, as Augustine would point out, we have the word that is inspirated in sacred scripture, fully divine and fully human, like any other book, but without error, and charged with a kind of prophetic charism, it's prophecy. Likewise, you have the word that is incarnated in Jesus, fully divine and fully human, like any other human, but without sin, but filled with divine love. Now, one we worship, the other we venerate. You can't worship the book, but when you dive into the book, you will see why, In, for example, Augustine points out that in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Paul, just by way of reminder, tells the Thessalonians that they are to hold fast to the traditions that they have received from us, either in writing or by word of mouth. I remember taking a graduate course in a doctoral program from Father Leanhart, this world-renowned expert on Augustine. I was still an evangelical Protestant looking into the Catholic faith. But, you know, when he was talking about 2 Thessalonians 2.15, in the, and through the eyes of St. Augustine, he was saying, tradition is the overarching category that Paul professes and Paul assumes and that Paul teaches. And mm -hmm. then in writing is one form of tradition, that is written tradition, and the other form is by word of mouth, oral tradition, which would be the liturgy, which would be the sacraments, which would be the worship of the church, most of which was never written down, but orally transmitted. So when I said, how would Augustine respond to Luther and Calvin in my tradition, which would say sola scriptura, and with a twinkle in his eye and a big smile, he said, I think Augustine would state what Paul meant, and that is sola traditio, <laughs> that it really is the living tradition of the breath of Christ's spirit that is transmitted 
This is how Augustine thinks, because this is what Paul is writing about. And likewise, in 1 Timothy 3.15, he speaks of the pillar and foundation of truth being what? The scriptures? No. The church mm -hmm. the pillar and foundation of truth. I remember asking Dr. R.C. Sproul, my mentor, what is for us the pillar and foundation of the truth? He said the scriptures. And I said, well, why do the scriptures point to the church as the pillar and foundation of truth? He said, that was a trick question. I'm like, well, <laughs> only if you're trapped in an unbiblical assumption because scripture doesn't teach sola scriptura. I approached not. another good friend, a former professor, Dr. J.I. Packer. I said the same thing. Where does scripture teach sola scriptura? And he said, well, technically speaking, it doesn't explicitly affirm it. Rather, that is our theological presupposition, Scott. You know, need I remind you? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. If our theological presupposition is sola scriptura, that we don't believe anything unless it's taught in the Bible, but sola scriptura is not explicitly taught anywhere in the Bible, aren't we sawing off the branch that we're sitting upon? I mean, we believe in the word of God, and so did Augustine but primarily the word that was incarnated in scripture, Christ, I'm sorry, the word incarnated in Christ, and then the scriptures that he fulfilled, but when he doesn't write anything, he doesn't command them to write anything, but he gives them all the power of the Holy Spirit, getting back to what you were saying earlier, Eduardo, in Matthew 10, when he sends the, the 12 disciples out in that mission discourse, he says, he who receives you receives me and him who sent me, but he who rejects you rejects me and him who sent me. The mm -hmm. stakes would be higher. I mean, if we rejected the two disciples that came to our town, you know, say Judas and Thomas the doubter, you know, we could protest and say, Jesus, that isn't tantamount to rejecting you. They, are, they were on the lower end of the totem pole. <laughs> no, the power that he gives to the apostles and the power that they get from the, the power that they give to their successors is this unbroken line of living tradition. You know, when Jesus said, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He didn't say on this rock, you build me a church. You know, no, I will build my church on this rock of Peter and his faith, but it's the church of Christ, not Peter. Mm -hmm. He is the builder. Peter is simply the instrument along with the other apostles. It isn't his church. It isn't multiple churches. It isn't 12 denominations. It is only one mystical body, the family of God. And ultimately, the glory of a father is wrapped up with the unity of his family. If you meet a man who's fathered two or three families, you've met a scoundrel. <laughs> if that's true for earthly dad, that's not less but more true for a heavenly father. By the power of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit, we profess the Holy Spirit, and therefore one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that is the task of the Holy Spirit, to work through fallible men like Peter, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if the Holy Spirit can take fallible men and give us the infallible word through their gospels, then it can also empower their successors to maintain an infallible interpretation of the infallible scriptures, which is what we refer to when we look at the magisterial teachings of the church mm -hmm. as the successors of the apostles. And an infallible book necessarily requires an infallible interpreter. That's right. right? Um, I mean, yeah. I'd like to, to, to quote this, this quote from, from St. Basil of Caesarea, because when I was getting ready to, to be confirmed, my spiritual director told me to, uh, to read his book, uh, Treatise on the Holy Spirit. Oh, I was just reading that last night. That's amazing. Oh, really? Yeah, yes. it is amazing. And he says, the enemies of the sound doctrine, pretending good intentions, they recur to proofs extracted from scripture, throwing away the, test the oral testimony of the fathers. So 
Uh, Basil of Caesarea, he says that the enem enemies of the sound doctrine, sound do doctrine, pretending to have good intentions, they throw away the oral testimony of the fathers. Perfect. You know, that, that reminds me of a conversation that I had with Dr. R.C. Sproul as I had begun my journey. I asked him, you know, if the table of contents of the New Testament books represents the canon that was achieved by the end of the fourth century from the 380s through the 390s. You know, on the one hand, the same bishops who gave us the New Testament canon, the table of contents, were also venerating Mary and the saints. They were also believing in the real presence. They were also affirming the need to intercede for those who are in the intermediate state that might be called purgatory. Why do we take their judgment in this instance, but reject it in all the others? Mm -hmm. But if you say that they are fallible, then how do we know that their decision regarding the canon, the table of contents, is infallible? And he looked at me, and with intellectual honesty and integrity, he said, Scott, the most we can say is that we've got a fallible collection of infallible documents. Wow. R.C. Sproul said that? Yes. And I'm, I asking, I'm asking that because R.C. Sproul is very popular in Brazil. Like his books are very popular among uh, Presbyterians in Brazil. Oh, so he, he was said the one who, He was forming me back in 1973, 74. Uh, I had his son as a student at Grove City College. I'm actually more grateful to God for the gift of R.C. Sproul being my formator back in high school and college. I spent a month with him down in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, had many dinners with him. We became friends. You know, he, he wrote me after he had heard I became a Catholic. I invited him to a public discussion. He, you know, he graciously and respectfully declined my invitation, but I've always saw him as a man of integrity. Mm -hmm. And when he said a fallible collection of infallible documents, it's almost as though I heard the branch snap on which mm -hmm. I was sitting, because if a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, how can I get up next Sunday as a Presbyterian pastor and read from one of the books of the Bible and say the word of the Lord most likely? But that is... <laughs> You know, the infallible word of God, according to our fallible judgment, you know, I realized, you know, that is like, you know, again, referring to our own founding fathers up north, you know, if George Washington had established us as a nation and the founding fathers gave us the U.S. Constitution and said, may the spirit of George Washington guide each and every citizen when it comes to interpreting the Constitution, I mean, apart from a court system, that would be a blueprint for anarchy, mm -hmm. which explains why 500 years later, you've got tens of thousands of denominations. And in a certain sense, apart from the Holy Spirit, a, a U.S. Constitution, even with a fallible court system, we're backing ourselves into the dictatorship of moral relativism and confusion, chaos with the woke and cancel culture. It just shows us that yeah. Christ through the Holy Spirit, with the apostles and their successors, is just barely enough to maintain the church for 2,000 years. But I mean, this is celibacy. They're not having children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It really is something that you look at and say, in every generation, the Catholic Church always seems to have significant crises that will just completely bring it to collapse. And yet somehow, against all odds, Mm -hmm. 2,000 years later, it's still being protected and guided and sustained in spite of all of its members from the top down. Amen. Well, I know I know you have to go in a few minutes, right? I do, yeah. Yeah, so I'm 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 coming to my to my last question. I just wanted to say that it was such an enormous honor to be able to interview you. Thank you very much. I'd like to tell you that. I, I became Catholic three years ago in 2019, but the, uh, I'm, I'm used to saying that a Baptist preacher made me a Catholic <laughs> because I was arguing with him about infant baptism. And 
Uh, it, that was in 2015. He was an American Baptist preacher. He had come to Brazil to give a lecture, and I was his translator. And I don't know why we started arguing about bap, uh, infant baptism. And I was, was quoting the Bible. He was quoting the Bible. And then I quoted the fathers, the fathers from the second century, uh, to, to back my position for infant baptism as a Presbyterian. And then he told me, that was in 2015, he told me, Eduardo, if you are going to use the argument of the antiquity of the practice to justify the practice, you are going to have to accept images, praying for the dead, and devotion to Mary. And I said, what? That, I, I, I mean, what, what, I'm, what I'm quoting here is, is the, the pre-Nicene fathers, is, is before Constantine. And he said, it doesn't matter. If, if you are going to be using the argument of the antiquity of the practice to justify the practice, you are going to accept, you are going to have to accept uh, praying for the dead, devotion to Mary, and images. And then he laughed and said, and you don't accept that, do you, my Presbyterian friend? <laughs> and, and I said, yeah. no, no, I don't. I, I, I don't know. He, he is aware of what he did to me because because of that, I dove into uh, the fathers and four years later, I, I was a Catholic. So my last question to you, if you want to comment on that, uh, feel free. But my last question to you, Dr. Han, is what would you say to your Brazilian friends that are studying your books and they are Protestant? Why should they become Catholic? Why, why couldn't they stay, I don't know, a Protestant with a, a wider view of the Catholic faith? Okay, two thoughts. First of all, you do not want to sin against the light. And so if the Lord God is giving you the light of Christ through the sacred scripture and it's leading you to his real presence in the Holy Eucharist, you know, maybe a few years ago, it would have been safe for you not to become a Catholic. But that's the one thing I concluded in my own prayer was that for me to delay obedience to what I know is true was feeling more and more like disobedience every day. The second thing I would say, building upon what you just shared about that Baptist pastor back in 2015, you know, the second century fathers, especially St. Irenaeus, mm -hmm. you know, Eusebius describes Irenaeus. Actually, Eusebius is quoting one of his contemporaries and said that Irenaeus was, quote, zealous for the covenants. In fact, Irenaeus speaks of the covenant as the immortal diamond that is found in scripture and in history. And Irenaeus was the one who fought the heretics in the second century who were pitting the New Testament against the old, the Gnostics. Mm -hmm. But that happens in every age. When you pit the new against the old, you would say, you know, okay, I admit circumcision was for infants in the old, but baptism is excluded from infants in the new. Wait, so infants were included in the old, but infants are excluded in the new? When you go from the old to the new, you move from great blessings to greater blessings. But how is it greater to exclude infants from the sign of the new covenant entrance, you know? And that was the key for Irenaeus as well. And so I would say be zealous for the covenants that God has established as a father. Here at the St. Paul Center, we're often emphasizing the fact that there was a covenant in creation called marriage. And then when it was renewed with Noah, with his wife and their three sons and their wives aboard the ark, that formed one family of four married couples. With the covenant with Abraham that God renewed, he's de described as a chieftain. He has a tribal family. He needs a successor, and so God finally sent him Isaac, then Jacob, and then Jacob's 12 sons became 12 families that became the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And so this national family that becomes an international kingdom under David becomes the Catholic Church, so that it's not only all nations under the Son of David. It is now heaven and on earth. One Catholic Church means universal. The head of the Catholic Church is not the Pope. He's the vicar of Christ, 
Christ is the only head of the church. There aren't mm. two churches, one up there and one down here. What Christ established with his ascension and enthronement is this one holy Catholic and apostolic church that is truly universal and will last forever. It's the bride of Christ. Don't poke at the bride of Christ. So don't sin against the light. That's what I would say. Amen. Thank you very much uh, for your time, for this amazing interview. It was uh, the last question. Eduardo, but of our first conversation. <laughs> yeah. Let's have some more. Oh, amazing. I'm glad to, to know that. And I would It's... love to come back to Brazil and visit the Aquinos, but also you. Oh, you amazing. Right you should. You should. Let's let I'll, I'll, I'll keep in touch with Mar Maria. She's such a bless blessing. She... And uh, let's I'm make sure that happen. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great one and know that your Brazilian friends are praying for you in your apostolate because it's been helping a lot of people worldwide and here in Brazil as well. Wow. Thank you, Eduardo. May God bless you and keep up the great work. Amen. Amen. Likewise, my friend. Bye bye. Bye bye. Muito bem, meus irmãos. Que aula! Eu tenho certeza que vocês foram profundamente abençoados. Eu tenho uma aluna, a Mayla, que ela escreveu uma coisa aqui, eu até salvei, que eu achei fantástico. Jesus amado, preciso anotar tudo. Sim, a gente precisa anotar tudo. Eu sei que foi muita informação. Eu falei para vocês no início, ele é uma enciclopédia bíblica. E ainda mais legendado... A gente vai lendo, mas você vai ter que assistir de novo, ir pausando e ir anotando. Eu anotei algumas coisas que eu gostaria de compartilhar com vocês bem rapidinho. Algumas pessoas perguntaram se vai ficar gravado, vai ficar. Mas eu anotei algumas coisas que eu queria relembrar com vocês. Olha só que interessante. Seguindo até o conselho da Marla, né? O Novo Testamento tem o seu habitat próprio a adoração eucarística, a Assembleia Litúrgica. A Bíblia foi escrita para ser lida dentro do contexto da Assembleia Litúrgica. O Novo Testamento é a Eucaristia e não um documento. Quando ele até fala em grego, né? Kainé diatheque. O Novo Testamento é a Eucaristia. Fazer isso em memória de mim, e não escreva isso em memória de mim, ele até dá uma zoada, né? Ele também menciona que todas as vezes que nós vemos a proclamação da palavra, nós vemos o sacramento junto, e o sacramento é um sacrifício, a Eucaristia é um sacrifício, a cruz sem a Eucaristia seria apenas uma execução. A gente só sabe que a cruz é o sacrifício de Cristo em nosso favor, é o, auto, é o auto oferecimento de Cristo em nosso favor, por causa da Eucaristia. Outra coisa que ele falou que eu achei fantástico, nós não repetimos o sacrifício. Alguns irmãos separados né, nos acusam de repetirmos o sacrifício da cruz. Não. Nós não repetimos o sacrifício porque é impossível repetir algo que é eterno. O sacrifício de Cristo ao Pai é contínuo, é eterno. Protestantes chamam orar a Maria, pedir aos santos, as nossas imagens de idolatria, porque, infelizmente, eles lançaram fora a verdadeira adoração quando eles lançaram fora o sacrifício eucarístico. Então, tudo que os protestantes têm nos seus cultos e nas suas reuniões é louvor. Tudo que os protestantes têm é música. Hoje mesmo eu vi um famoso coach protestante falando assim... Quando você vai adorar a Deus, você canta. É, ou seja, para o protestante, adorar é cantar. 
Se você é ou já foi protestante, o momento de adoração do culto é o momento de música. É ou não é? Vamos fazer um, um congresso de louvor e adoração. Quando eu era protestante, eu fui em vários congressos de louvor e adoração. O que, que era o congresso de adoração? Congresso de música. Ou seja, o protestante só tem louvor. Ele só tem música. Ele não tem adoração porque ele tirou o sacrifício eucarístico. Aí ele vê a gente louvando Maria, louvando os santos, e diz, ah, eles estão adorando. Não, a gente não está adorando, a gente está louvando. Louvar é bem diferente de adorar. É bem diferente. Mas você acha que a gente está adorando porque você só tem louvor. E você chama louvor de adoração. Scott Hahn disse isso né, na live de hoje. E, por fim, uma coisa fantástica que ele disse no finalzinho da live. E eu queria... Uh, Relembrar, obediência adiada, é desobediência. Talvez existam protestantes nos assistindo nessa noite que já entenderam que a fé católica é aquela que Cristo estabeleceu, que a igreja católica é aquela que Cristo estabeleceu. Você já entendeu isso, mas você está adiando a decisão. Ouça o que o Dr. Scott Hahn disse. Obediência adiada é desobediência. Pare de ser desobediente e volte para casa. Meus irmãos, que noite memorável, maravilhosa. Eu vi algumas pessoas dizendo no, no chat, será que vai ficar gravada? Vai ficar gravado. Eu preciso deixar gravado, porque é muita informação. Você precisa assistir com atenção. Eu sei que legendado demanda algo a mais né, de atenção. Muitas pessoas assistem às lives fazendo outras coisas. Quando a live é legendada, você precisa ficar ligado. Então, sim, ela vai ficar gravada. Uh, quando essa live foi ao ar pela primeira vez, até algumas pessoas comentaram, ah, já vi essa live... Ela foi ao ar a primeira vez, pouquíssimas pessoas assistiram, até porque eu tinha pouquíssimos inscritos no canal, agora eu tenho um pouco mais. Só está faltando você para se inscrever, mas eu tenho um pouco mais. Você que ainda não é, não é inscrito, se inscreva. Então ela vai ficar salva para que você possa saborear essa verdadeira aula de teologia. Eu tenho uma amiga querida, não vou falar o nome dela, porque senão vocês vão ficar bravos com ela, mas é uma amiga querida, uma irmã de caminhada, que ela falou assim, Dudu, ela é tão amiga que ela me chama de Dudu, Dudu, você tem que, você não pode deixar essa, la... essa live do... do Scott Han salva aí, não, você tem que cobrar por ela, eu falei, não, eu vou deixar ela salva. Ela quis dizer que essa live é muito preciosa, é muita, é uma aula com um dos maiores teólogos católicos do mundo, e ela vai sim ficar salva. Bom, eu quero agradecer algumas pessoas que contribuíram com o canal. Vamos lá, vamos agradecer? Flávio Antônio Paulo, que meu aluno, mandou um super sticker. Muito obrigado, Flávio. Aliás, ele quase toda a live manda, para não dizer toda, né? O Caio Aguiar mandou um super sticker também. Muito obrigado, Caio. Essas manifestações de generosidade encorajam a gente. Ireuda Guedes também mandou um super sticker. Obrigado, Ireuda. Eu, Silene Rodrigues. O Júlio César se tornou membro. Valeu, Júlio César. Seja bem-vindo. João Paulo Holanda Soares também contribuiu com o canal. Obrigado, João Paulo. O Pedro Santos, meu aluno Pedro Santos e sócio do canal. <risos> Obrigado, Pedro. Eu falo, né? Quando o Pedro não contribui, eu acho que ele está com raiva de mim. Mas toda live ele contribui. Obrigado, meu irmão. A Cíntia Maria Sansão contribuiu e disse, professor, 
O seu vocacionado, sua vocação é a ajuda que pedi a Deus para compreender a Bíblia e as doutrinas da Igreja Católica. Cíntia, que honra ouvir isso, minha irmã. Obrigado, querida. Muito, muito obrigado. Eu fico, de fato, é, honrado com, essa, com esse comentário. Bom, fica aqui no canal que você vai aprender ainda mais. O Hernani também mandou um super sticker. O Hernani também, em toda live, colabora com o canal. Existem algumas pessoas que toda semana colaboram. Eu sou muito grato por vocês. Tem gente que nunca colabora, talvez. Hoje é o dia, né? De você ajudar a pagar as contas. Ó, o meu xará ajudou aqui, ó, Eduardo Oliveira. Eu também quero agradecer algumas pessoas que contribuíram pelo Pix. Olha só. Teve um pessoal que mandou pelo Pix. Aliás, deixa eu projetar o Pix aqui. Porque... você pode fazer essa contribuição via Pix e ajudar a pagar as contas do canal e nos encorajar a continuar produzindo conteúdo. Olha só. João José Franco, muito obrigado, João José. João José. Aliás, o nome do meu caçula é João. Deiva Cardoso de Oliveira. João Batista Zisco, mais um João. Virgínio Pereira, muito obrigado, Virgínio. Edna Alves, Marta de Fátima, Fernando Dominiguiti, William Luciano, obrigado, William, Rilva de Fátima, Lilian Maria, Joilson de Lima, Mônica Rodrigues, Francisco Xavier Vieira, Lorena Barbosa, Emerson Telmo, Marília de Nazaré Peixoto, Jarbas Alfredo, Sônia Mendes Brito, Tiago Gomes Julião, Tiago Conceição, Ana Helena Oliveira Santana, Manise Araújo de Almeida, obrigado, Manise, Antônio RM de Almeida, Percival da Cruz, Hudson Takaki Menezes, Clay Silveira, Jorge de Andrade, Marco Antônio Costa Batista, Sirlene Celi de Resende. Muito obrigado, gente. Muito obrigado. Essas contribuições, de fato, me honram. Ó, o Cláudio Kirten. Obrigado, Cláudio. Essas contribuições me honram e me encorajam. Me encorajam. Vocês sabem que produzir conteúdo toda semana... Custa dinheiro, é grátis para quem assiste, mas custa dinheiro. E por causa de algumas pessoas extremamente generosas, a gente continua a ficar, a gente, a gente consegue continuar uh, produzindo esse tipo de conteúdo. Muito bem. O Arthur Jorge também ajudou aqui com o Super Sticker. Obrigado, Arthur. Chegou mais aqui. Heloísa Dantas e José Geraldo de Almeida. Muito obrigado, gente. Bom, a gente está caminhando para o fim da, da nossa live. A gente está tá caminhando para o fim. Deixa eu ver aqui. Beleza. Padre Rodney. Estou aguardando sua resposta. Vou responder, padre. Desculpa. Eu estou com mais de 100 mensagens aqui na fila para responder. Desculpa, meu querido, mas eu vou responder. Com certeza. Pessoal, o seguinte. Antes da gente encerrar, eu repito, a live vai ficar salva. E eu convido você a rever essa live com um caderno e uma caneta e anotar. Vocês viram que o doutor Scott Hahn deu uma verdadeira aula para a gente, uma verdadeira aula para a gente. E vocês viram no final que ele disse, né? Estou com saudade do Brasil, estou com saudade do Felipe Aquino, professor Felipe Aquino, que me acolheu aí a primeira vez que eu fui. Ah, há rumores de que ele vai voltar ao Brasil ano que vem. Parece que ano que vem ele vai estar no Brasil novamente para uma conferência. Então, ele disse que quer voltar 
aqui. Então, eu aconselho você a rever essa live tomando nota. Eu quero convidar vocês para a imersão Como Ler a Bíblia Segundo a Fé Católica. Vai acontecer sábado agora, dia 23. A gente vai passar seis horas juntos no Zoom, de 10 da manhã a 4 da tarde. A gente vai parar só para almoçar. Então, vai ser aí umas seis horas com uns 40 minutos de almoço. Mas a gente vai passar o dia juntos aprendendo a ler a Bíblia aprendendo a estudar as escrituras a partir do coração da igreja. Vocês entenderam o que o Scott Hahn disse? Que o Novo Testamento não é um livro, o Novo Testamento é um sacrifício. O livro aponta para o sacrifício. E os documentos que nós chamamos de Novo Testamento foram escritos para serem lidos a partir da Assembleia Litúrgica, a partir do coração da igreja. E nesse sábado eu vou ensinar vocês a ler a Bíblia a partir do coração da igreja. Para você participar, você vai pagar um valor simbólico, R$ 27,00. É R$ 27,00 para você ter 27 razões para participar. Tá? Se a gente faz alguma coisa de graça, o povo não vem. Então vamos lá, 27 razões para você participar. Uh, você vai estar numa plataforma onde você vai poder tirar dúvidas, interagir comigo, mas, se você conhece o Zoom, você deve saber que as vagas são limitadas, existe um número máximo de pessoas, e esse número máximo está esgotando. 90% das vagas já foram preenchidas, é isso mesmo que você ouviu. 90% das vagas já foram preenchidas, eu tenho certeza que as vagas vão se esgotar. Não deixe que as vagas se esgotem. Se inscreva aqui na, na descrição. Eu quero você ao vivo no sábado, para a gente interagir. Mas algumas pessoas estão falando, ah, eu, eu não vou poder participar ao vivo. Ou então, só vou participar de manhã, só de tarde. Tem como ter acesso à gravação? A gravação você tem acesso a investindo mais R$ 9,90. R$ 9,90, é isso mesmo. Entendeu? 9,90. Essa ninharia, essa micharia de 9,90, você tem acesso à gravação também. Mas o mais importante é a gente estar junto. Por isso que eu estou insistindo em você participar, porque eu quero que você cresça no conhecimento das Escrituras. Uma coisa que eu descobri depois que eu me tornei católico é que todo santo era altamente conhecedor das Escrituras. O primeiro livro de santo que eu li na vida foi A História de uma Alma, de Santa Teresinha do Menino Jesus. Ela cita a Bíblia o tempo todo. Depois eu li os, as atas do julgamento de Santa Joana d'Arc. Ela cita a Bíblia o tempo todo. E ela era analfabeta. Depois eu comecei a ler São José Maria Escrivá. Ele cita a Bíblia o tempo todo. Depois eu me inteirei mais sobre... Santo Antônio de Pádua, um dos maiores pregadores da história da igreja. Santo Antônio conhecia livros da Bíblia de cor. Não é versículos de cor, não. Livros de cor. Enfim, nós precisamos ter intimidade com as Escrituras Sagradas. E eu convido vocês a participarem comigo dessa imersão. Tá bom? Eu quero dar boa noite a vocês, saudar a todos vocês, agradecer pela, pela presença. Eu preciso agradecer mais algumas pessoas que contribuíram com o canal. Marcos Hermínio Sassinski, muito obrigado, Marcos, pelo Super Sticker. A Raquel Macedo, muito obrigado, Raquel. Em dólar, olha como que eu estou chique, minha gente. Obrigado, Raquel. Também algumas pessoas contribuíram via Pix. Deixa eu ver aqui quem mais contribuiu via Pix, depois do meu último agradecimento. Vamos lá. Opa. Mirinaide, Isaura, obrigado. Rosa Maria, João Bosco Antunes, Rejane Campelo, Gislane Maria, Milton Rogério da Silva Gomes, muito obrigado, Milton. 
Eloísia Fernandes, José Geraldo, Gleiciane, João de Jesus, Carlos Alberto Crispim, Rosângela Domingues, Cláudia Kirten, Cláudio Kirten, Jorge de Andrade, acho que os demais eu já, já mencionei. Muito obrigado, gente. Muito obrigado pelo carinho e pelo encorajamento. Muito bem. Uh, eu vou encerrar agora, mas eu quero fazer mais um, um convite para vocês. N nesta segunda-feira, segunda-feira, né? ou seja, na próxima segunda-feira, às que horas? Sete e meia da manhã, a gente tem o programa Verbum, que é uma leitura orante e sequencial das Escrituras Sagradas. E terça-feira que vem, nós teremos mais uma live da série A Bíblia Me Tornou Católico. Toda terça, às nove da noite, a gente tem esse encontro. Então, eu aguardo vocês. E lembrando que você ainda tem a possibilidade de se inscrever na imersão. Ainda. Eu não sei quanto tempo mais você terá. Mas você pode ainda se inscrever. Aguardo vocês. Tá bom? Deus abençoe vocês, Deus guarde vocês, tchau, tchau. <SILENCIO>